as poker is today, as online poker is today, I'm kind, I'm kind of, uh, I'm pessimistic on online poker as it is today. I'm very optimistic on offline poker because I, I think it's growing, it's flourishing, and I think it's only going to get better. But I do think looking 10 years in the future, the only thing I would say I'd be confident in is that I don't think online poker will look as it is today. The interview by Poker Org. So welcome to the interview. Today we've got uh, Eugene Ketchloff. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Eugene? That's exactly correct. Thanks, Greg. Good okay. to be here. So Eugene and I have worked together a number of times over the years, uh, especially at Card Player Magazine, and he's got quite the history in poker. And uh, he won the 2007 Doral Brunson Five Diamond Classic for $2.4 million, back during the crazy heyday of the early days of Poker Rise after the moneymaker effect. He also won the 2011 Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure for $1.5 million. And he has quite the journey he's been on since arriving in the U.S., I think, at 10 years old. Was that correct? Yeah, about. that's right. Yeah. So you've had many stories written about you. Then you, you left poker for a while. Uh, everybody goes through different journeys. And now you're back in a big way. So let's talk a bit about, a little bit for people who don't know you so well. Uh, you left Ukraine in 2010, correct, with your mom. You talked a bit about that, about that journey. No, not, not 2010, 1991. Not 2000, sorry, I'm talking about when you were 10. When you were 10. When I was 10. Ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that was that was uh, uh, I was that was 1991, and it was an interesting time because it was literally when the we left on the day like the Soviet Union fell apart. So as we were leaving, it wasn't even Ukraine back then. Like as a country, it was still the Soviet right. Union. Um, and uh, as we were leaving, my mom, you know, was telling me that you know tanks were surrounding the, the city, and we weren't actually sure whether we'd actually be able to take off. Um, and, you know, everyone's kind of sitting, it, it, there was a lot of delays and, you know, the plane was sitting in the ground for a while. And I remember even once we did take off and, you know, eventually once we landed in uh, New York, I remember um, as a kid, there were lots of uh, cameramen, like like journalists waiting for us uh, uh, when we came off and like they were taking interviews from people who were on the plane, I guess, just kind of asking about the situation. Then I remember my dad was already in the country at that time. Uh, he was yeah. already in New York. And when we came home, you know, we turned on the news and I remember watching uh, on the news as they were showing, you know, people on, on our plane. Uh, to me, everything was like brand new. But I was just like, as a kid, I was like, wow, this is like very interesting. What was New York like at 10 years old running around? You start, he was in Brooklyn. Was that correct? Yeah, uh, he was in Brooklyn. Um, it was wild. I mean, it was so different from anything I knew back then. I mean, again, growing up in the Soviet Union, it was, it was very, very different. You know, I think the thing that uh, stood out to me at most at that age was uh, all the graffiti that I saw uh, wow. as we were driving. Like back then, there was still a lot of graffiti uh, in New York and all, like, all the subways and um, and all the different types of people, obviously. You know, you, we didn't see that back then. Um, so, you know, everything was very, very new, uh, especially for a 10-year-old kid. Where'd you go um, to school when you started it, when you went to Brooklyn, when that area? Where'd you go to I, I, went, I first went to a Jewish school, like a, a yeshiva, for, for a couple of years. But it was basically just because um, my cousin, uh, who was older than me, he went there and he recommended my dad that he get, you know, maybe he can get me in. But the problem was that I was way too young for the school. Like, like basically, I finished third grade in, uh, um, in Ukraine, and then I went to seventh grade uh, here because that was the youngest grade because I was the smallest grade. So I was like two years younger than anyone. Like, it, wow. it, and at that age, it's like, a, you know, it's, it's a huge difference. And, and it was, it was really tough for me. Um, so I struggled there for about a year and a half. And then, um, and then eventually my parents actually decided to transfer me to a normal public school, uh, just with kids my age. And, and also like, because the Jewish school was a uh, more Russian speaking school at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, my English wasn't actually getting better because I didn't actually use it. I was just kind of like, you know, speaking Russian more. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that they did. And I think they were glad that they did. So I, I eventually, when I was like 12 years old, I transferred to a public school and, you know, quickly started speaking English and just, you know, uh, uh, basically was uh, on, on a grade on my level. <laughs> which is definitely better. Well, any crazy uh, New York stories? I've got like, when friends ask me, how was New York? I've always got, uh, I lived there 10 years also. Mm. And uh, I've always got some crazy stories, whether it be something happened on the streets or especially the subways. Mm. Do you have any New York stories as a teenager running around that uh, you recall? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I did have two, two, uh, two times when I was robbed in New York. <laughs> First time when I was like maybe just a few months, a few months in the country, and I was like on my way to school or out of out of school, and two kids jumped me and I don't know, like searched through my bag and like I don't know, took some stuff. Took my, I had like a watch. They took my watch or whatever. And then, and then another time, like a year later or a year and a half later. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a little bit dangerous, uh, you know, in, in some parts of uh, New York, uh, for a young kid who, you know, basically didn't speak English and, you know, whatever. Uh, and then I kind of, you know, once I kind of integrated and I, and I got, you know, I got to know the culture and I got to know the area a bit better. I got to know the language. Um, it was all right. There, there, you know, um, I can't really complain. I, you know, I had to get used to, I think the thing that stood out for me the most in New York was just how many different cultures there were in just one, this one little city. Um, it was actually to a degree where I, I didn't even know what an American really was until I got older. Cause I never met an American. There were, there were no, you know, yeah. true Americans in New York. It was all immigrants. And I remember it was like, there was, there was even like this funny story when I was like uh, 15 years old or so, I was, you know, AOL just came online and I was chatting with, I remember with some girl from um, from North Carolina, and I, and I was so used to just asking people, "Where are you from?" And I was like, "Where are you from?" She was like, "What do you mean?" She's like, "I'm American." I'm like, "Well, what do you like? Where are you? Where are you from?" She's like, "I don't know. Like five generations ago, you know, they came from you know Ireland." But I was like, "Wow, so you're oh, so you're like an American American?" I was like, "Like I've never met one of someone like that, you know, in New York." So it's like fascinating to me, uh, you know. And now I laugh at it, but it's that's that was like the fascinating thing about growing up in in Brooklyn in those days. You know, everyone was an immigrant. For sure. I loved living there. Just uh, it's a little warmer in L.A. So for the most of the part. So I, I enjoy. Living yeah. There too. But I enjoyed business and traveling and in, in, in New York City on the subways. It's kind of hard to uh, you probably experienced this. Maybe you didn't. Uh, when you're dating, uh, I was brought up. You make sure that your your date gets home, gets in the door. You know, growing up in Virginia, drive her home, watch her get in the door. My dad said, make sure she get she gets in and in and, and New York City. And my, I lived at the top of the island, 215th Street, last stop on the A train, right? So mm-hmm. to, to, to go out on a date in Greenwich Village, and then maybe they live in Brooklyn or Queens. So if I had to take them, I would take them all the way Ooh. home and then take two and a half hours to get back home. You know, after 11 or 12, 12 o'clock, subways one run, what, yeah. one, twice an hour, right? So it's difficult. Sometimes I just say, you know, know, I'm a poor actor uh, and and working at Macy's or something. Here's here's twenty dollars. Let's get you in the taxi. Make sure you get home okay. (laughs) You know (laughs) what? You know, a gentleman is supposed to do, right? Uh, Yeah. I guess I I guess in just those days, I didn't I didn't really date anyone from like far away. Like the people the people who I did date were usually like in my school or in my you know kind of in my neighborhood. You know, so so I didn't I didn't encounter that, but I can imagine. you chose to go to NYU. You can talk a bit about the business school there and your experiences and why sure. you chose why you chose the career at that time. I didn't know what I wanted to do as a kid. I kind of kind of thought I wanted to do something in business. I didn't really know anything else. Um, NYU seemed like a great choice just because it was like close to home, and I you know I wanted to spend more time in Manhattan. I wanted to eventually kind of like move to Manhattan, um, and uh, you know I kind of figured I'd find my way there. Uh, so um, I went to the Stern School of Business uh, at NYU to undergrad. Um, it was a great school, very tough, very competitive. Yep. Um, I, I lived at home, though, so I, I think maybe that's something I kind of regret. I think I kind of wish I actually stayed in campus. Uh, I would have gotten to know way more people. Um, but it was it was an interesting experience. You know, I, I kind of – I studied finance and international business. Um, and even even, like, midway through – through, I still wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. So I kind of figured, well, I'll just go, you know, maybe work in some corporate environment and just kind of like figure, figure my way out. Um, and, um, and then I, and then uh, maybe a f- around that time, I met a friend who was a very successful trader uh, in Brooklyn. And he kind of, he sparked this interest in me t- towards trading Um and so I was like, oh, maybe I could try something in that direction. So I was a kind of that was kind of like flowing in you know in the back of my mind uh, to some degree. Um, so uh, you know, so it was like it was a, by the by the time I was about to graduate, it was a combination of like thinking about well, maybe I could do something in trading, maybe I could also apply, maybe it's some big corporate job, and you know, get an entry level position there. Um, and then around the same time, poker came about. I, I, I you know, I got really interested in. Uh, 
it, I, I was just like watching poker, uh, you know, on TV, watching the World Poker Tour at the time, and um, and you know, started playing with my friends. Uh, so th th those three things were kind of, you know, the what was happening to me at that time. Very interesting. And you played in the. So where did you start? Are you playing small games around campus, or then I, I read that you had played some underground games where you did run into a, a player that we all know is a superstar in the game. Uh, and you guys kind of traveled together. Talk a bit about that journey uh, playing underground in New York City. And did you run across sure. any other great players that eventually we would know about underground there? Well, my first like half a year or so um, or a year, I just played with friends at home, like yeah. just home games, nothing, really nothing special. But then I like then I started playing a little bit online, like playing sit and goes online. And then eventually, like uh, I found out that there were there were underground games in, in, in the city, in New York City. Um, particularly, I remember Ace Point was like a big club at the time uh, that we would that I would go to quite often. And I think somewhere around, I think it was an Ace Point where my friend and I we met uh, Nick Shulman uh, and became friends with him. He was already kind of he was already kind of somewhat well known because he was playing high stakes limit hold'em at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, we became friends, and we kind of started like traveling a bit together. Uh, yeah, that, that was like that was definitely like the most memorable. You know, but he was like my, one of my closest friends uh, at the time that we kind of came up with together. Uh, in terms of other people, I can't remember to be honest. Um, Where was that game located yeah. in New York? Was it in Was it in Manhattan or was it in one of the boroughs? Ace Point, yeah, Ace Point was in Manhattan. It was a, it was a big club in. Um, I still remember where it was. It was like uh, it was Upper East Side. It was like. Maybe like uh, maybe something like in the '60s, maybe 63rd Street, East okay. 63rd Street, and like Second Avenue or Third Avenue, somewhere around there. I don't remember exactly, but it was a big club. Uh, there was a lot of people there. Um, yeah, it was it was a good time. Well, how did this then turn into uh, you thinking about this as a career? Were you trading at the time, and then you just you were maybe playing in some local tournaments, going to Foxwoods, things like that? Yeah, I was trading a little bit at the time already, um, and I was you know. Simultaneously, I was uh, playing like these little sit and goes online, and I was able to make like 30, 40, 50 bucks a day, which was really kind of nice. You know, when you're living with your parents, you yeah. know, that, 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 was, that was a nice, uh, good amount of money. Um, and uh, <laughs> I didn't really get into any corporate jobs that I applied to, like anything kind of that I was hoping for. I was kind of distraught at first. Then I realized it was actually, it was a blessing that I didn't get, <laughs> didn't get in, in, into any other jobs. Um, what were your parents like? Well, you went to NYU Business School. Now you're playing poker. Were they a little bit? How did they, you know, how did, did they support you? Were they like a little resistant in the beginning? And how did that go? Well, my, my dad was supportive always because he came from a gambling background. So for him, it was kind of easy because I, I, that was also like, I think one of the reasons why I was like in my blood, that kind of approach. My mom didn't know what was going on, but she trusted me enough to kind of give me the freedom to, to explore um, what I'm going to do. Um, but then as they kind of saw that I was like starting to make a little bit of money here and there and they kind of saw potential. And then, you know, after my first trip uh, to uh, Atlantic City, I think it was, uh, or Las Vegas. No, it was Las Vegas, um, where I had like a pretty, pretty reasonable uh, win, you know, that kind of kicked things off and gave me more room to, to explore and cont continue down this path. What, so what I was like for a few for a few years, I was playing poker and then trading uh, simultane oh. simultaneously. Um, yeah. Were you trading online or going? You trading where? What? You were I was trading. No, I was trading online. Yeah, I, I, I was. Um, first, I was part of some small like day trading firm in in New York. Nothing, nothing. I mean, like in Brooklyn. But then I joined a pretty big firm called Opus Trading Fund. In it was a Steven Schoenfeld fund uh, in uh, in the city. Uh, the, so I would go to office, and I, by by that time I moved into Manhattan, um, yeah. and I would go into office. Uh, and this was maybe around, from around 2006 to around 2008, uh, is when I, you know, when when I traded there. Well, so what what were some of the eye-opening moments you had for the game? Obviously, the studying for the game has certainly changed with these young guns and guys using solvers and things. Talk about about the evolution of your strategy. Uh, study and how you perceive the game and how that has grown over the years as you obviously did, did very well during those years you know, 2011 mm -hmm. 2011 you've won over nine million dollars playing playing poker so talk a bit about the early days of the heyday of the brunsons and and everybody playing in all the tournaments and the superstars you've met and you coming up fast in the game 
Yeah, I was. I, I think the, the the key thing is I was like really obsessed about the game. I re- I really enjoy, really loved the game. Um, there were no tools, as you said back then. Uh, that that I mean, yeah. nothing nothing real that you can learn from. Uh, the books didn't didn't. I mean, they they all seemed outdated uh, as they always were. They they didn't really seem applicable beyond just getting like a a very basic level of understanding. Um, so the best way that, that I found to learn was just kind of like talking to friends and, and uh, you know, people like Nick Shulman. And then also observing, I would I would love to just observe games, even if I wasn't playing them, I would just like watch games. And then especially if like a hand goes to showdown, it was like incredible because I would like just go through the logic of the hand and try to figure out what is the, you know, what are these like top players doing and why are they doing this? And I, I always found myself learning a lot and then, you know, exp- and then, uh, trying to experiment with uh, with the very same approach, um, so uh, that kind of like uh, exploitative style back then was uh, very appealing for me because it was also very interesting on a psychological level to try to figure out my opponents and try to figure out how are they thinking about the game, and then like, and then how can I exploit that? How what moves can I can I make to convince them of you know what I want them to believe? Right. Uh, did, and so did you and Nick talk a, a lot about the game in, in that regard? Uh, we did. I'm curious. Yeah. 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 We just, we would just discuss, a, you know, a lot of hands together, a lot of, a lot of different ideas and strategies. Nick, Nick had a, you know, always had a very, very creative, uh, unique mind for, for these things. So I definitely learned a lot from him. Um, yeah. And then it was just like all about actually like, implementation and experimentation and seeing like, you know, on a like large scale, does, does this actually work? You know, if so, you know, in what instances, if not, then maybe why not? Um, but it was, yeah, kind of like a progressional thing. Right. I mean, so you left trading behind totally after obviously you, perhaps you won. Yeah. I th- it was, it was actually like in 2007 when I won the big event with Doyle Brunson, you know, that right. gave me so much freedom, all that money. Um, I actually didn't drop trading completely because I actually, at first opened up my own uh, tiny little fund with a friend uh, yeah. that, you know, we got, some, we put some money together. Um, but after about a half a year or so, I just, I realized I couldn't do both at the same time because poker was really starting to take off for me and it was taking up a lot of my time. And I realized I have to choose one or the other. Um, so I decided to, you know, I really enjoyed poker. Besides enjoying poker, I really enjoyed the idea of traveling all over the world and playing and, you know, kind of getting to meet a lot of different people. Right. Um, so I just kind of, focus in on poker and, and, and stop trading completely at that time. Well, you were traveling everywhere. I, I noticed you had some deep finishes in EPT events. So you just were playing yeah. totally wherever you were driven to go. You went to play, correct? Do you have any favorites? Yeah. Enjoy? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I, I played a lot of tournaments, but I also, at that time I was playing a lot of cash games. I really enjoyed uh, oh. cash games and a lot of high stakes cash games. Uh, and especially like mixed games. I, I always enjoyed uh, different, you know, different varying mixed games like you know i played in in atlantic city a bunch i played in uh, in bobby's room uh you know i really enjoyed playing uh, mixed games at, at a high level um but then i started i think uh around 2010 2011 was i was i was friends with daniel negrano and he and he, he said you know it'd be a good idea for you to try out for the focus arts team um and then i was like well yeah, and I was like, "Well, what should I do?" He's like, "You should win something big." And that was like the whole story of me like playing the first super high roller and be- getting heads up with Daniel and beating him. It was like it was like a movie. It was like you know straight out of a movie. Uh, it was it was incredible. Um, and then obviously after joining PokerStars, you know, I was focused a lot more on tournaments than I was on cash games. Right. What? Yeah, mixed games interesting because obviously Nick Shulman's a, a very uh, prolific uh, mixed game player and very successful. Yeah, yeah. You guys coming up in that time. What did you learn the most from working with? I just interviewed Daniel for my last interview uh, hmm. about his new podcast with his wife Amanda. Uh, can you tell what did you learn about working with Daniel, being around him during this time period? Obviously, he was rising and one of the big stars in the game. Uh, what did you learn the most from him? Take away. Yeah, I mean, he was he was always a superstar, you know. Um, you know, one of my kind of heroes in poker. Um, I would say, like, the thing that stands out for me the most about Daniel is his curiosity for the game. Like, he's just so naturally curious, yeah. and always like, you know, asking others, like share, sharing strategy, trying to figure out what are other people doing, and you know, where where what he can he be missing potentially. And that's, yeah, I would say that's the most interesting thing about Daniel is like. For so many years, he still keeps up with the game, and he he actively, um, you know, he's actively learning and, and hiring help when when needed to learn. 
so that kind of passion that he has for the game is, uh, is I think, what's one of the most impressive things and, uh, you know, that makes you appreciate why he became, so, you know, so successful at it. Yeah, he, he still does that. He had a big heads-up match with Doug Polk, I remember, a few years ago. Right. He went deep into heads-up study, something he had never really yeah. done the same thing, and he took on a coach. And Dan was pretty amazing in that regard, always wanting to learn, you know? Yeah, and and uh, I would say at some point in my career, I actually struggled, uh, I guess, because I like I had like a monsterly great year in 2011. I was like player of the yeah. year. I was like num- number one in the world. And then that actually went to my head to some degree. And I think, uh, um, and then, uh, and I kind of needed that, I think, because 2012 was kind of rough for me. In 2013, I started to realize, okay, things aren't, things aren't just going to go my way all the time like this. And I can't just sit, sit around and think that, you know, I'm the best now and I could just, you know, play at a high level. Like I actually, the game was changing all around me and I, and I realized I need to uh, adapt as well if I, if I want to, if I want to stay at the top. So that was like a, kind of like a, uh, you know, a kick in the ass for me. I, I know I was going to ask you about that year, 2011, when you won the Caribbean adventure there at the beginning of the year, you probably, you were on top of the world. Is that sort of like a positive tilt kind of thing? I mean, where did you go and how did you correct uh, this trajectory you were, this road you were going down? We go, Hey, this is not quite working out. I'm not, I can't win everything. Uh, how, and how did you deal with the variants? How did you deal with mentally, physically, emotionally? How did you uh, approach those kind of uh, issues within yourself? It was tough, right? I mean, it was like, a, it was many different things happening at the same time. First, I kind of, first, I was just like, kind of upset and like thinking, well, is it just bad luck? Am I, am I running bad or what is it? But then I realized, wait, people are doing, diff- people are playing differently than I was used to. So, so then play, if people are playing differently, I should, I should adjust. And then I'm like, okay, well, how should I adjust? So like, I realized I have to really kind of start kind of from the ground up, like reworking certain ideas I had about the game. Um, so I just stayed, I started taking a lot of notes for myself, a lot of uh, things that I kind of used to do in the past and try to kind of build up new strategies and new ideas from the ground up. I think one of the things that I kind of regret to some degree um, is that I was still mostly a loner in poker. A loner in poker is in that like, I didn't really, I wasn't like part of some big group that kind of shared strategies. I was kind of yeah. doing, I was used to doing things kind of on my own. Um, and I think that's part of the, you know, part of the reason uh, why I kind of got stuck in my own kind of head for a while and didn't realize that the game was changing uh, all around me. And, you know, it took, it took me longer than I think it would have had I been, you know, surrounded by, by, by like a group of people who were kind of coming up at the same time yeah. um, for me to realize that I, that I should do something. So when you began to work on those parts of yourself, uh, you didn't have, you know, people to talk to at the time or chose, chose that path. What were the kind of things that you worked on personally to, to regain your confidence in the game? I, I observed a lot, uh, not just other people at the table, but also myself and my own reactions to, um, to, to, uh, whether it's emotional reactions or logical reactions to whatever's happening at the table. And then, um, uh, everything from just like taking notes on different hands and, and, and trying to figure out the lo- the inherent logic, uh, behind what people are doing. And then just trying to, Counter, counteract and uh, f- find counteractive moves that that worked really well uh, to just very general emotional kind of um, um, feelings that I that I had and and you know uh, like something that you notice like if you, if you if you go on like a long losing streak you start kind of losing confidence and then you're kind of you, you start playing more passively you're kind of uh, you, you're just kind of like pass- pessimistic about th- those things. So even noticing that is important because right. th- that also influences things a lot. Um, so I would just, you know, writing those things down from really, really helped me uh, to identify them and then to just kind of bu- build my confidence back up. Did, did you have any issues? You were obviously a finance major uh, uh, and very versed in that regard. Any issues as far as bankroll, understanding how to, to use that in your poker game, in your in your life? I you definitely understood it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You I have definitely, to share with people when going through that kind of variance after winning so much money and then maybe hitting a bit of stale part uh, and then coming back. Talk a bit about that journey. Yeah. I, I definitely, un, you know, understood bankroll management, but I would say I didn't stick to it very well. I think I was naturally always a little, I had a little bit too much gamble uh, in me. Um, but at the same time, I was always also very cautious and kind of, I've seen like too many stories of, 
very successful poker players who kind of went up and then went busto and just like went you know went went broke completely broke and you know it wasn't like a lot of stories that weren't even known to the to to the public um but those stories scared me and i was like i i I, you know i never want to get to that place um because i knew that just because i won like a couple of tournaments it it might seem like it's an easy thing to do but it's actually very very difficult and very rare so you know I, i should really be careful um but at the same time i was still kind of uh often a little bit too confident in my own ability. So I risked a little bit too much uh, in, in, in many events that, that I think also added on to the, to the pressure uh, and you know, just to the general roller coaster of emotions that I didn't appreciate enough uh, at the time. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say like w- one thing I think that's, that I maybe would have changed again, uh, had, had I, you know, if I were able to go back, something that a lot of people did do, is like again, like being part of like a group of, of professional poker players. Um, not only are they exchanging strategies, but they're also kind of exchanging pieces with each other. Often, like let's say they go on a trip, and you know, sure. they'll, you know, they'll change 20 percent with each other, and then what happens is you kind of distribute the volatility uh, amongst the group. So even though you're not going to have any like huge wins, you know, for yourself, but you're also not going to have these huge losses, and you're more likely to just have like the, the line upwards is just going to be more likely just more stable rather than volatile. So that human aspect of, you know, being faced with a huge loss is, is not really there uh, in those situations. And and I think I didn't appreciate it at the time. I only appreciate now, you know, as I got older. Right. Did you have any other mentors along the way or, or friendships in the game that you really valued at the time as you were going through all this? I mean, I was really close friends with Elke uh, at the time, oh. but we, we, but, you know, we traveled a lot. We played together a lot, but we, uh, but our friendship was more like just a, a very general friendship. We, did, we we spoke about the game a bit, but we didn't. We, we never really, um, sp- you know, got into it in, in too much depth. So n- not to the degree that I had, you know, w- when I was when I was friends with uh, with Nick, uh, right. for example, or with others. So you know, that, again, that's one of the reasons I di- I didn't really speak to anyone that closely about the game. Um, right. So I was kind of just on my own. So there was a time period that you took a break from poker. Is that correct? For, for a little bit, as far as playing really uh, the high level competitiveness, yeah, I think. Well, uh, the, the break that I took from poker, like the big break, was probably like in 2017. Um, okay. I I finished with my with uh, with my poker stars contract in 2016, and then 2000, uh, then like early 2017, um, I launched a company with uh, Luca Pagano we, uh, in esports uh, called Clash, and we were just kind of focused on that. Um, I, I knew I kind of, uh, I didn't want to, when I was thinking about myself and like when I'm going to be 50 or 60, do I still want to be a poker professional, uh, and reliant on that as an income? And I was like, that idea really, you know, didn't sit well with me. I wanted to do something else. I, you know, I always dreamed about building some kind of a company. Um, so, you know, so I, I quit playing poker full time and, you know, started focusing on my company. So I, I still played a little bit here and there. I, I was then an ambassador for a local Ukrainian uh, site uh, called Poker Match at the time for a couple of years. Um, but again, I was mostly, I, I wasn't playing for new, anything nearly full time and then, uh, you know, just play here and there a bit since then. What was your company focused on? You're based out of New York or? No, no, no. The company with Luca was, was on esports. It was an esports organization. We organized oh, oh. events and we had, uh, we had teams who played under a brand. It was based in, uh, in Italy. Oh, okay. So that's why I kind of, uh, at the time I was living in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in Ukraine and Luca was living in Italy and I would just travel a lot to Italy. It was definitely more convenient for me to be, um, in Europe, uh, at the time. Right. So, uh, I know that you, your my editor said, asking about your partner at Matchpoint NYC and you talk about your physical well being is something that's very important to you and you have a goal to promote poker as a healthy lifestyle. Can, I mean, that's obviously something that has been a passion of mine also. Can you talk a bit about that journey? Sure. Yeah, Matchpoint NYC, was, it's, it's one of the largest sport complexes, um, if not the largest, in, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and, um, yeah, I was, like, uh, I was one, of the, one of the partners who, who were the, kind of the founding members. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, it's one of my best investments. I'm, you know, it's a, it's a very successful club here in, here in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, 
I always, uh, for a long time until then already, I was already like really into, into working out into like, different kinds of challenges. I realized how important um, being physically fit was for poker. Um, so all these things were kind of like a, a passion for me. So, you know, certainly this was like an extension, uh, extension of that. Right. But then you also, as I understand it, you start to follow more and something that's up my alley for many years, a more of a, a pursuit of meditation and personal transformation. Correct. Can you talk a bit about yeah. that journey? And I've been through it and still going through it. Meditation is not something that just, you know, you hit the high points every day. There's ups and downs and you've got to sit yourself in the chair or on the ground and just do it. Right. Just like writing or anything else. Um, meditation has been a big part of my life since I left New York City. Uh, share a bit about that journey and how it affects your life now and your poker and your business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, maybe around 10 or 15 years ago was like when I first kind of tried meditation and it was done. And I, I, I always kind of real I, right away I realized, oh, this is actually like pretty cool. It could be a good part, a good thing to, to relax to, uh, especially like when playing in poker tournaments or uh, just poker in general. Um, but I always found it hard to make it uh, uh, like part of like a daily routine or whatever. Like it, it's just yeah. really, really hard. Um, I always struggled with it. I could, I couldn't make, make a habit out of it. Um, uh, so it, that took a long, long time. I think, you know, I think most people struggle with it because it's just kind of, it feels boring to just kind of sit there and, and like, and, um, uh, and struggle with it. Um, but uh, I did practice with it. I would say meditation became a, a much larger part of my life. Maybe four years ago, three, four years ago, I started like actively um, practicing it. I actually, and like last year, for example, I went to uh, my first uh, uh, meditation retreat, like a silent, silent retreat for a week uh, oh. in up in North, yeah, up in North Carolina. And I'm actually, funny enough, I'm actually going again uh, this Sunday uh, for a week. So I'm going to be completely, it's, it, it, you're completely offline. You okay. turn off all electronics. You do not communicate with anyone. You don't even look into the eyes of anyone else. Uh, you're kind of just in the mountains and you're just, you're, you don't speak. Um, so you're just kind of just in this beautiful, beautiful area and just doing a lot of meditation and, and internal kind of observation. Um, so that experience was definitely transformative for me last year. Um, it just kind of made me more grounded, more present, more appreciative of, of things as, as kind of they are. Right? And, and then just like realizing that, Everything I'm going through, whatever problems I may have, these are all things. These are all just thoughts in, in my mind. Uh, so the practice of just like observing, observing your thoughts is, is very helpful for you to identify and not believe in your thoughts um, uh, so intently. Uh, and that and that and that kind of practice allows you to kind of, you know, stay more in the kind of in the present moment and to just uh, uh, just be more an observer in life rather than, you know, um, overreacting. If I were to say to to whatever's happening to you. And just appreciate things like what's good or bad. Like these are all kind of like my internal perspectives. There is no such thing as good or bad. There is no, you know, yeah. uh, these are all kind of illusions in our mind, in our, you know, in our minds. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's been big for me on like this kind of yeah. like, I don't know if you'd call it like a spiritual level. Well, it's, it's a bit of an awakening, but obviously you mm -hmm. talked a bit about the struggle of sitting down. It's really about dealing with the struggle when you sit down. Like you said, we were bombarded in this society by so many things um you know we didn't grow up with the internet but the internet advertising every time you get in a car go anywhere all these things are coming at us right and you know and all the thoughts that are in your head are not necessarily yours or or you should be attached to them in any shape or form so there's sort of need to like oh that's my thought that has nothing to do with me that goes out these kind of things what i've done something similar called a vipassana i don't know if they call yeah. it yeah, something that's like similar. That's similar. Similar yeah. where it's 10 days of meditation for 10 hours a day. And right. It's probably yeah. the toughest thing anybody would ever go through. And we're, we're using blindfolds where during those 10 hours, oh, wow, you're, extreme. you're in darkness, right? So oh. it's a fascinating process to see the evolution of the mind and how you begin to quiet it. Because like you, no cell phones, no, uh, we, we do look into each other's eyes. I've been doing this for like 25 years. And uh, it, it's silent. I mean, if you've ever gone silent for seven days, and probably most people haven't done it for a day, after seven days, you you kind of come to this kind of peace inside. It's an involvement because you'll go through emotions during those seven days, right? You're yeah. crying, laughing, yeah. all, all the shit comes up. 
And then when you leave the space, you leave the meditation that your area that you're at and walk into a Whole Foods or something like bombarded by all this, like, oh, my God, what is all this stuff? Uh, people coming at you. So it's an amazing experience, but it does bring you back to a more uh, zero point or grounded point where you can then deal with everything, include especially your mind, the internal stuff that we all deal with. How has this, have you applied it? How do you, have you used it? Have you began to play more live tournaments or how has this affected your business in doing those kind of powerful practices like seven days of silence? Well, uh, I would say it certainly helps with, uh, with, um, kind of like the emotional swings that you go through, through like, let's say we, you know, we're, it, it helps you to realize just how much we're living always, you know, either in the, we're like worried, worried about the future or regretting things in the past. Like it's just always a combination of those two things rather than just kind of like enjoying the moment that we're in that, 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 that we're never enjoying. And, uh, and it's not even like about enjoying it, 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 There is like, e- even that is, it, 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 mm, you can't possibly like be, always positive like that that's nonsense like even that's nonsense like just appreciating the the perceived good and bad appreciating just reality as it is um and you know these kinds of experiences they just kind of help you realize that the um the need for for preference is uh is kind of is illusory it's like impossible you can't possibly achieve one thing over another there's like duality to to you know to kind of to all these things and and just observing that uh, you kind of re- relax and you just don't, you don't react so much to uh, something that's negative or positive. You just kind of realize that that's just how life flows. So be, being practical, it helps you in life um, uh, to not overreact to certain things. Even like if something bad's happening in your life or maybe you feel like unlucky, you're just like, okay, that's, that's just a part of life, whatever. It'll be fine. Some things will kind of work, work themselves out always. And right. something that I, and, and like a big thing that I realized for myself is like, no, like th- think back to my past and like all the problems that I had at the time that I think about, and they've all resolved in one way or another. And, and so it's like, obviously, whatever problems I have today, they will also resolve. But the fascinating thing is I just don't know how, but there is a trust that they will resolve one way or another. So I, I would say like, that's the biggest piece of advice that I could give to anybody is just like trust that your problems will resolve and you, don't, you just don't know how. It'll happen. Uh, what's ho- interesting when I started teaching meditation, and I, I'm certifying Kundalini Yoga and teaching a little mm. bit, that uh, getting someone to sit still for three, even three minutes is hard. Some people can't even sit still. Stillness is a part of it. And I see some of the great poker players being very still at the table during moments of conflict, right? They're just sitting mm-hmm. still. They're not like looking around. They're just very still within themselves. But stillness sort of will lend itself to create the mind still. So if you can sit the body still, uh, but I find that a lot of people have an issue just sitting still because we're always looking at TV, yeah. reading a book, watching the computer, look at your phone, just to sit still and, and take a conscious breath does change things. And I've seen some poker players use it in their practice. You know, I, yeah, I completely agree. And I, I, what I would say to that is, um, because we're bombarded with so much kind of like little dopamine things, whether it's from our phones, you know, all these like distractions, like television, electronics, what, whatever it is. Uh, it's almost like we're like drug addicts on these little, little dopamine hits from everywhere. So it, 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 it appears that we're kind of bored when we're not doing anything. Um, but what helped me personally was trying to kind of meditate on act- on boredom and like figure out why am I bored? Like who is bored? What, what is it in me? that is bored and what is it seeking and like what so and then like when you kind of really dive into that like you just kind of really dive really really deeply into yourself um suddenly i realized like bored the idea of boredom the idea that i was bored was just like another thought that was just kind of like trying to uh you know i don't know control me or whatever and i was like oh this is illusory as well this doesn't really exist as well and then and then suddenly like i wasn't bored anymore and i could just sit for a long time and uh and it was much easier you know to to now meditate and like just do really long meditations uh just because i realized like boredom is it's not a real thing if 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 you can really say that it's probably your ego going hey we're we're bored exactly let's move on yeah yeah. let's go do something yeah 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 Yeah, then it's like well with ourselves and our feelings, which is not always easy, you know? Yeah. It's not always easy because, you know, most of the time, um, you know, we're kind of trying to push away and kind of like, 
negative thoughts that we may have and, and just kind of like try to think, you know, p- about positive things, but, but at the same time, like the negative things build up and, and you kind of, you kind of have to let them be as well, uh, to, sure. to, to be healthy. Um, so you just kind of have to give room for everything that arises, just let it be. Yeah, I, that's a, that's very good advice. And then just sit with it. Uh, did you you mm-hmm. seem to came up with a friend of mine that uh, has become a superstar in poker too? And you guys, I'm sure, played together. Uh, and he's considered the people call him the Zen monk of poker. You know, Andrew Andrew Lichtenberger. Did you have? Yeah, yeah. Who's a very much obviously uh, went through his career with yoga, has a really beautiful presence at the table no matter what happens. I'm like. Really, you just got I hacked and just you know bad beat you, and you're still smiling. So uh, I, I love uh, Chewy's demeanor at the table. Who he is as a person, very kind and humble person too. For you know success that he's had. Have you run across him in your journeys? You both kind of yeah. I mean, I, I can't I can't say we were friends or anything like that, but we certainly right. I mean we certainly know each other. We would always say hi when when we saw each other, but I mean we, we never really like hung out or anything. But he was definitely like someone. Uh, if you were to ask me who, who is like one of the people on poker who is very calm and kind of zen, uh, I would definitely, he, he'd be, he'd be at, you know, at the top of the list. Yeah. It's been fun watching him evolve too. Uh, he's taking a, you know, taking time away from the game and getting back. We just talked yesterday about being, he's like driven for 20 years to be so competitive, so competitive mm-hmm. on such a high level. And he says, you know, I got to take a break from that and just be, you know, he has a beautiful life in Vegas and. Uh, business pursuits and things like that. So it's an interesting journey 20 years later after, I think you, you needed that drive and passion. Like I'm going to do nothing but poker. I'm going to win and have people you talk to and dive into every book and, you know, training site you can find to, I think, get to the level you got at, but then you got to find out how do I stay yeah. even and happy and grounded at this place. Right. I, I, I would say, uh, I would say the key thing, like, um, uh, the key thing, the key, the key thing for me has been finding balance in all things. Um, I, it's like to realize that uh, any extremes, uh, w- whether to the light or to the left, like they're never, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's never good. Like it's never a thing that's going to give me peace. So uh, being more practical, if you're extremely focused on poker, if you're just like really obsessive all the time, like, like it's good to a degree. Uh, the same thing with meditation or with like you know all these like spiritual practices. If you're, it, you know, if you're, I mean, that's good. But if you're like too much into it, like that may also be kind of detrimental. So it's just like about finding balance between these things. There's no, no one's going to give you the answer to, to what the balance is because the balance is different for every, you know, each one of us. Yeah. But I would, I would just say that it's important for you to find for each one of us to find that balance that, that gives us peace, that, that makes, that gives us like a, a comfortable way of life. So uh, I'm sure that's kind of what Chewie's been going through, being competitive at such a high level. And then figuring, well, I need some balance in my life. Maybe I shouldn't be so focused on poker. And that's also the kind of like, been my uh, observation about my own my own life as well. It's like going from extremes to extremes, and then realizing that I'm not going to find my answer. I'm not going to find peace in extremes. It's it's about the balance, uh, you know, in in these things. Well, we'll talk a bit about your you sort of merged. I'm looking at some of the questions I have. You merged playing poker with business recently. Can you talk about any of the new projects you're working on? Yeah, so uh, for the past year and a half, I've been um, working on uh, on a project kind of uh, that that's partially dealing with with uh, with poker, and uh, I'll be announcing it soon. I, th- I think the um, uh, what I would say is like the, the big problem that I observe um, as a former professional poker player and like a current kind of like recreational lover of poker uh, is is just how different the game has become and. Um, in terms of, um, I, I would say from the very ground up, like if you think about, when I think about my own past, like when I was coming up in poker, uh, if you could if you could deposit a hundred bucks into a site, you'll you, you that you know, if you're a new player, you know that deposit will last you a pretty long time. And if like if you were debating about whether you should play poker or you should just play casino for fun, right? Like if you if you just you know play some slots or roulette or whatever, uh, uh, definitely. A, I think an argument could be made that you would have more fun playing poker and your money would last you longer in poker for a while. Uh, I think that's changed today. And I think that's, that's kind of like the underlying issue. I think because of all these tools, because of all these solvers and just how good professional poker players are and just how good, even like average, um, uh, average pros, if you could say, I'm not even talking about the high level pros uh, and just how quickly they will grind down 
uh, a, a purely recreational player. Um, I think uh, today, if you're just, you know, some average person who's just like thinking about trying poker or just want to have some fun, you know, after work, your quote unquote hundred dollar deposit may last you longer um, and in a casino uh, playing blackjack or playing slots. You you may have uh, more fun um, rather than playing poker, just because I think you'll you'll lose it quicker in poker. And I think that's a problem. I think that's not sustainable uh, for poker overall. Um, so I think um, we should find a way to kind of bring back a balance to where uh, professional poker players don't necessarily have that huge edge. They, they should certainly have some edge, but not as big as it's kind of becoming now. It's like the same thing as like why you don't you know you don't go to a casino. Uh, and if you're going to play a casino game like uh, like slots or roulettes uh, or whatever, uh, the casino's edge is not like monstrously huge. It's just small enough to con- to, to get you to you know for you to have fun, yeah. yeah, to keep going. Certainly over time you lose, but it's not but it's not like you you can't ever win. Like you'll have times that you'll win as well. And as a professional poker player, that should be your goal as well. You want to win in the long term, but if you're going to continuously crush your opponents, they're just never going to come back. So then, who are you going to win from? So I think that's something that needs to be addressed. So how do we need to make the game more accessible accessible for casual players? And what challenges do you think poker faces uh, as we move forward here? Yeah, I think um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't think you can change the game too much. I, and that's been kind of been tried as like trying to play, you know, to really change the, the, the way poker poker is played. Um, but that doesn't work because people like people like whatever Nolan and Holden and, and PLO. Um, but I think you. But I think even the changes that you see now that are happening within these games, like the, the small things, are, are are positive. Things like uh, um, um, like bomb pots, for example, or or things like uh, uh, what's it called the the squid game, right? Like uh, yeah, I don't the know knit if you, game or the knit game, the stand up game. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, these things are great. Like because the game, because the rules are the same, but but the great thing about um, the, these new things is that they really change the dynamics of the game. They they force you to think. They force you to think differently. There are no solutions for for how to play the game. Um, like you can't go into a solver and get a solution. At least today, you can't uh, and get a solution for it. So to me, that's what makes it really exciting for me because that's like everyone's kind of like back to the starting place and like trying to figure out and. Okay, well, you know, how, how do I approach this very unique spot? What, what's the best thing to do? And, and you're just trying to do your best. So, and everyone's just kind of t- trying to exploit each other. There, you know, there are any kind of like stalled positions. Um, so, I think that kind of brings people back to to a level uh, a level playing field. Um, you know, so I think you can explore things in, in you know in that direction. Um, I also think. Uh, um, Maybe increasing volatility would be good, and I'll explain the reason why. Because okay. uh, by increasing volatility, you get uh, professional po- play- professional poker players emotionally involved, and and, and like if they uh, and what that'll do is like that'll destabilize their game. Also, right? like if if you're if you're now emotionally involved, uh, and I think recreational players like volatility, right? Because th- that's what they're in. That's what they want to play big pots. Uh, professional players are probably mostly staying away from volatility because they want to have like a stable earn. But I think if you get the volatility in there, it, it, it may destabilize their game. They're not going to play, you know, quite as well. And, and I think recreational players will, will appreciate that. So I think you, you, you know, you can also come, come up with ways to, to increase volatility. I think it'd be good. Oh, that's very fascinating. What do you, what do you think about the uh, influx of AI in the game and studying the game and around, around poker at the moment? It's changing poker. Um, yeah. What do, you, yeah. How, what do you think it's going to affect poker in the future? Like ten years from now, what's the game going to look like? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, we're already kind of seeing that with the big, big problem with like bots online, right? So it's yeah. it's it's so hard to know who you're playing against, and I think that's the problem with like kind of like public poker rooms today is that like you just don't know who you're playing against, um, and I don't I don't know if it's a winning battle for 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 online poker sites if they can continue because these bots because there's just too much incentive. To, to get a bot to work because if because they'll have such a big edge against recreational players, right. um, so uh, so as poker is today, as online poker is today, I'm kind I'm kind of uh, um, I'm pessimistic on online poker as it is today. I'm very optimistic on offline poker because I, I think it's growing, it's flourishing, and I think it's only going to get better. Uh, but I think online poker will kind of have to change uh, in some way. 
Uh, you're already kind of seeing, you know, different kinds of changes. For example, you see, uh, I saw the recent change with GG Poker where, you know, the high stakes game became private. Um, I yeah. think that's one one kind of reasonable thing that, that, that maybe needs to happen. Maybe certain games kind of have to stay segregated. Uh, but I do think looking 10 years in the future, the only thing I would say I'd be confident in is that I don't think online poker will look as it is today. Whatever form it'll be, it'll be it'll be very different than it is today because I don't think it it can it can survive as it is today. So I, I think it has to evolve uh, um, in some way, and I think a lot of people are going to be uh, trying different things. You know, not just me. No, I think uh, so. for me, you know, I I just I my best memories from poker are like um, are coming up and like and and playing and having fun in poker, and I and I kind of want to show people like like that side of poker that that just just that um that entering poker today it doesn't mean you have to start working with solvers and then like really like dive in deep like that it can actually be played for fun and 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 it's like a battle of uh you know different psychologies and that's what kind of made it fun for me in in the first place where do you go right now with your game what do you what do you plan to play more uh more events or are you combining your business and all this together give me a little more hints of things you're working on and where sure you want to go. i mean you were one of the superstars of poker i mean to be a poker stars ambassador was always a uh you know nirvana for a lot of players and you reached um, that and, and made some great scores and had a lot of fun in the game and always a very highly respected player so where do you see your future going for the game uh at this moment with business and poker yeah, I'm I'm doing a lot of content creation actually uh, now. Uh, I have like a team helping me with it, and um, I think uh, I I played my first poker event in a, in a few in a number of years. Uh, actually, a few months ago in Cyprus, I played the EPT Cyprus. Wow. I I was only able to, I only had time to play two events, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and I'm I'm going to be playing. I'm going to Vegas uh, at the end of the month to play the World Poker Tour. I'm really right. looking, looking forward looking forward to that. Uh, so I think my focus is on is on just kind of playing uh, like the medium stakes. You know, I'm not I'm not planning. I mean, at least at this time, I'm not planning to compete like at the, at the highest levels because I you know I also th- don't think I can compete at the highest levels, and I don't really want to because I actually want to show off the game um, as it could be played with uh, more players who are just playing it for fun, you know, recreationally, and, and some of the cool exploitative things you can do, and uh, and just you know do my best to to, to show from my side. Uh, that exploitative play is uh, is probably actually best at you know at those levels. Um, well, whereas maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the case. Maybe it's not the case in, in the super high rollers. Well, the the best players in the game, talking to the Chidwicks or the Foxens and uh, Corneth, uh, they know the solvers inside and out. But really, they're playing exploitative poker. But they all yeah know this level yeah w- w- within that skeleton of the solvers like the, the exactly. skeleton is like the base and then and then they exploit you know post that yeah that, that's like I would say that's the highest level uh, of the game. Um, uh, I just to give you like a, a specific example, I always think about um, I always think about. Like uh, if you take Phil Hellmuth for example, right? Who, who obviously plays exploitative. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't work with solvers. If you put him into, if you put him into a super high roller, and then like you take someone like uh, I don't know Stephen Chidwick. Like okay, obviously I think Stephen Chidwick will have you know much bigger edge, uh, yeah. I think versus Phil. But if you but but if you take Phil and you put him into the main event in the World Series, right? We have lots of recreational players. Um, you'll find that he does really, really well in those events, like way, way better than you would think he does. And I think the reason, and the same thing with Daniel Negreanu, right? And I think the reason for that is because they uh, use all these other exploitative variables that that other people, you know, maybe don't know, even at the highest levels. Um, you know, someone like Daniel or Phil are maybe very ch- chatty with players, and like they'll, they'll, you know, they'll pick up tells and pick up reads and. They'll use their image more. So these things they work on on uh, uh, against recreational players. They may not work against you know pros, but they'll work on, uh, against those. And so they'll be able to uh, have a larger win rate versus you know uh, quote unquote like so- people who just study solvers and right. play on uh, on those medium stakes versus recreational players. I know it's been interesting to watch the rise. I had an interview with Adrian Mateos, obviously one of the best in the world. Adrian, yeah, and, uh, Jesse Lonis, who's come up the last couple of years, and Jesse doesn't do a lot of studying. Uh, he's very intuitive and very talented and has the respect of some of the best players in the world. So it's interesting to see against all these guys who are very um, fast, uh, 
you know, know the solvers inside and out and every single spot and situation. And then to see Jesse come along and have such an amazing year that he's had this year. He's leading the uh, GPI Player of the Year award between him, you know, between Adrian and David Coleman. So it's kind of interesting to see that kind of player, which you would have expect come up in your your uh, time period. Very exploitive. Uh, have you followed Jesse's career at all? Watched him uh, play? I've never played with Jesse. I, I hope I get a chance to play with him at some point. Yeah. I've definitely seen him. I've definitely seen him. His name come up a lot, and uh, and like the, the 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 immense amount of success he's had recently. Um, but I don't I don't know much beyond that. Uh, yeah. But I imagine he must be good because the amount of success he had, especially like in the in the high rollers, uh, it's you know um, definitely can't just be luck. Um, but it's like if I if I think back to the past, there's always been like periods where like new players kind of like came up and they were always doing something different than, than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it really takes in poker. Uh, and that'll always be the case in poker. The best players will always be doing things that are um, not standard, you know, that are kind of – that most people will not even have in their games and will find weird and strange and they won't understand it first. And then by the time they do understand it, uh, either those players have already evolved or someone else has came up and doing something very different again. And I think that's the fascinating thing about poker. It's not it's not a stale game. It's always it's always changing, evolving. Um, that's what that's what made me love it uh, all the yeah. time. And like that's what I always appreciated. You know, following the best players of their time, whether it was like you know Durr and then like Jungle Man and then um, you know um, uh, Victor Blom. You know, like all these players who like had their times and like they were doing wildly different things. Uh, and then, like, observing them and, like, uh, and just, like, at first, you don't know, are they just wild? and Are they just running good? And then, you know, it's only with time that you, re you know, if they don't burn out, uh, that you're like, oh, there, there's something there. And there's something to learn from them. Yeah, there was some madness behind the method there, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And then everybody sort of catches up and figure out how to wait. To exactly. Wait. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask a little bit. I mean, you've watched your buddy Nick Shulman become one of the best commentators, if not in the world, with what he does. He's very fascinating, very good at that. Did you uh, see an inkling of that when he talked a bit about poker with you? I mean, what have you watched and listened to, you know, Nick in the past couple of years? He's amazing. On the yeah. Market. Yeah, he, he, I, I always knew he would be amazing and stuff like that, just simply because interacting with him, first of all, he has a great sense of humor, one, you know, yeah. one of the funniest guys I know. Um, so, like, and, he, and his knowledge of poker and love of poker is so deep that I always loved, you know, spending time with him. And like, he's just, he's just funny to be around with. And like, and then he can go on the, on the deep level, uh, and, and, you know, and think about poker. So it's like those two things I feel like are the best combination you can, you can imagine for a poker commentator. Cause he's like, so basically he's, he's entertaining for both for professional poker players who are watching and for recreationals. For uh, sure. So like, that's what makes him so good. I mean, he's doing a nacho impression that's perfect, right? I don't know if you heard his nacho impression. Yeah. He's, he's right on, on the money. But his yeah. impressions are good uh, uh, with, every, uh, he, he, with he, everybody. He does it with everybody? Yeah. Oh, and from what I remember, yeah, yeah. He, he does it with a lot of people, and he's so good. No. So Hilarious. that'd be kind of exciting to see you at the WPT. He's going to play a full schedule, just a handful of events coming up in December? I wouldn't say a full schedule, but maybe four or five events. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Um, I'll, I, I plan to be there for, for two weeks. From uh, uh, from around December tenth to to the twenty third, yeah, so just uh, just under two weeks, um, and I'm looking looking forward to it. I've I've, I've never I don't think I've ever played. Maybe I've played once or twice, but I never played WPT at, at the win. And I've heard like incredible things about the organization and how well it's kind of everybody executes there. So I'm really looking forward to it. No, it's yeah. a beautiful space, and it's like a great energy there. I was there last year for a while. Mm. It's been amazing having a chance to catch up with you after working with you uh, when you were coming up in the game and with so much success. Uh, I wish you so much fun. I, I, you, your life has really expanded well beyond poker, and you seem very happy and grounded. So it has to be all the other things you're doing outside of poker that really is inspiring you to wake up every day and do your business and do the game. It's, a, it's really fun to see. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a combination of all these things. It's, it's, I don't know. It's just like, uh, I guess you get wiser with age. Um, so I hope kind so. Of I hope so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you always kind of look. You always look back, and 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 I feel like if you feel like you've improved from your younger self, then, then then you're getting wiser. But it's definitely been fun, and and definitely good catching up with you as well. Well, thank you for joining me today.